I don't know what it was, whether it was the recent news of the passing of the legend, the greatest manager of all time, Bobby the Brain Heenan, if it was the fact that Raw was running up against Monday Night Football, and I'm trying to pay attention to fantasy football stuff. I don't know if it's just the fact of I felt like Raw going into it was going to be a half-assed effort. Um, but I was in a bad mood for this show, and even thinking about talking about it here in this video has kind of got me in a grumpy mood. So I probably will be reflected in this lame-ass review just a little bit. Just a little bit, I'm just saying. So let's talk about the show, and frankly, get it the hell done and over with. Because the WWE, it seems like, largely mailed it in this week. So why should we do anything other than that? I'll give them credit from the very beginning, though. They finally did something with Kurt Angle and Jason Jordan actually trying to play off of the father-son dynamic. When The Miz is talking trash about Kurt Angle and it gets to a certain point, the son who's longing for his dad's attention and affection and love comes out and gets angry like you would see happen in the real freaking world. The real world. You know, you're finally playing off of it. Like you did this whole thing and setting it up for weeks and doing all this stupid crap to sit there and get to this moment where you reveal that Jason Jordan is Kurt Angle's son because it's one big fucking rib because that's what we need to do in today's business. We need to do ribs instead of actually trying to draw freaking money and make big stars. But here is a platform to help try and get a guy over by association. And here's what feels like to me the first real thing we've done that's been logical, that's made any damn sense since the announcement. Not sending him out there to job to John Cena so that way then next week he can job to Roman Reigns. Play off of the fact that he's supposed to be Kurt Angle's freaking son. I'm just saying. It doesn't always have to be spectacular. Just sometimes it has to be sensible and believable. And this was. And it's set up, you know, what happened at the end of the night with the six-pack challenge ultimately for the number one contender to Mrs. IC title at No Mercy. Cool. All right. Uh, Bailey returning, <laughs> it's whatever. At least she turned out to a came back to a pop, which is impressive considering the arena was half fucking empty. She got quite a bit of a pop for half an arena. I'm just saying, especially when all the fans are on this side and nobody's over here. It actually sounded like there was an entire arena full of people, so it kind of fooled you. But Nia Jax versus Alexa Bliss probably turned out exactly how you thought it was going to be. And, and of course, now we bring back Bailey, and we're just going to shoehorn her in. And all, and all of a sudden now, we've got a five-way match for the Raw women's title at No Mercy because that's exactly what we needed. But honestly, who really cares? Let's rip on a stupid fucking tweet from Sam Roberts. Like, if I had that head of hair, and I know I'm one to talk about hair. Somebody gave himself a haircut. I know, I know, I know. Go ahead and comment and get the fuck over it. But... I would, I would kick myself if I had that head of hair, just saying. But what he really should do is kick himself in the dick for what he tweeted out. I cannot believe this stupid son of a bitch, with his no dignity having sell out to WWE ass, dared tweet a comparison of Bailey and Sasha Banks to the fucking mega powers. He compared Sasha Banks and Bailey. To Hogan and Savage. You know what? For once, instead of me crapping all over this and talking about how incredibly imbecilic this is and how dare this dude sit there and tweet this out and try to do it with a straight face, what the hell happened to having some pride in yourself, some damn dignity or some common sense, I'm just going to let y'all blast away on his ass on social media. Y'all blast away on him in the comments section because it's not worth talking about for me anymore. Give me a fucking break. Sam Roberts, fuck you. Um, the three-team tag. This was actually a really good match with the bald jobbers and Sheamus and Cesaro and Ambrose and Rollins. It was actually a really good match. Really long, but really good. But ultimately, it's three teams I couldn't give a fuck about. And I don't give a damn about their title match at the pay-per-view, the special event, whatever the hell you're going to call it. So yeah, while the match in and of itself is good, it did nothing to get me hyped for the tag title match, and it did nothing to get me to care about any of these guys at this point. Something that I can care about and something I can get behind is we're finally playing up Kurt Hawkins' losing streak. 
Heading into Raw, he was at 0 in 114. That's 114 losses in a row, baby. And they've got something here. And of course, they ultimately screw it up. But for now, they haven't yet. So let's just pretend. What we should pretend is that this company will have enough sense to play this out for a very, very, very long time. To the point where they play this up to where Kurt Hawkins can become an integral part of your television and he always loses. And you have different people come up to him and trash talk him about the fact that he sucks. You have other people come in and try and get him pep talks. And the fact is, no matter what he does, even sometimes he gets help. He tries to win by hook and by crook. <clears throat> he still can't get the job done. He goes into a state of depression. He starts doubting himself. Then he tries to play the old Brother Midnight reverse psychology, Bebe. And he says, Bebe, I'm going to try to be the world's worst wrestler ever, Bebe. <laughs> I am the biggest loser, Bebe. I mean, you should play this crap out until it gets to, like, the mid-200s or the 300s. I mean it. How shows everything. Send him to SmackDown just so he could freaking lose. And I'll put it this way. If you're going to say, well, that's a way to bury a guy. That's a way to do this and do that. No, it's a way to actually get people so invested in a character and so involved in a character that I promise you, if you did enough with Kurt Hawkins over a long enough, extended enough period of time... There would come a point in time where people would be chomping at the bit for this guy to finally fucking win one. And they'd be dying to see it happen. And they'd be so eager to see it happen. And what you would ultimately do is you get to a point where you could position yourself somewhere around SummerSlam 2018 or maybe Survivor Series 2018, whatever. And you could have some type of heel champion on one of the two brands and The Miz would be a perfect guy for this role. Talking about he gets to pick his championship opponent at a big four pay-per-view. And of course, as he logically would, he's going to take the path of least resistance. And it would be Kurt Hawkins. So you wouldn't even break the streak for him to get the title shot. He would be hand-selected and picked by the heel champion. Because he feels like this is going to be easy street. And imagine... Just imagine you would get to that point of all of a sudden this guy who's never won shit <laughs> in this current run, who's lost every match, all of a sudden has a shot at the freaking world title. The ultimate underdog story. Brian, Daniel Bryan, you could take that and blow it out your ass. The crowd would be hot for this. It would be insane. I promise you. It's all great to think about in fantasy, but ultimately this company is not smart enough to freaking do that. And if you say, well, I'm not going to make Kurt Hawkins champion, it's like that. You've said stuff about people wanting to make Kurt Hawkins a world champion and everything else. You know what? When you get guys like Jinder Mahal, the Coco Beware of WWE champions, it pretty much lowers the bar where if you get the story right to me, you could do it with just about anybody. And here the story would be something totally different, totally unique, and it would really work. But ultimately it doesn't matter because they'll screw this up too. Um, and we got a lot of talking. First, it's the big boys talking. I'm, of course, talking about Braun Strowman and Brock Lesnar. And this live via satellite interview, I thought, absolutely sucked. I didn't think it was a good platform for either one of your guys. You're having these two guys sit down when they're big, kind of monstrous, larger-than-life-looking dudes. Why wouldn't you put them in a platform where they actually stand up so that way they can look like bigger, larger-than-life guys? It's one of these things I get the kind of feel they were going for here. It just didn't work for me. And the vibe of the talking back and forth between the two of them just really didn't work for me. And honestly, when we get to that match at No Mercy, which I anticipate being really, really good, the only way that you really get the maximum return out of this, to me, would be to A, have Braun Strowman beat Brock Lesnar, and B, have Paul Heyman flip on Lesnar and associate himself with Strowman. And if you sit there and say, why in the hell would you do that? Well, at this point in time, Lesnar's the champ and the arena's fucking half empty anyway, so what the hell difference does it make and even over the span of just a month as we've gotten into the football season this company's lost about a half million viewers estimated for raw if not slightly more so why not gamble why not take a chance because clearly the brock lesnar experience of him winning the title isn't working but of course the company is probably not going to do that because they have grander visions of sending samoa boy Roman Reigns at Lesnar at 34, and everybody's going to poot on it. I, I just don't get it. 
And speaking of the Samoan stud muffin, as a certain beagle would talk about, Roman Reigns. You know, the, the segment goes a lot better when he doesn't have to worry about sharing time with Cena, and Cena doesn't go off the reservation, and Cena doesn't do whatever the hell he wants to do, and the WWE doesn't try to structure the segment to intentionally make their future golden child look bad. Um, I thought Reigns wasn't okay here, but I, I think this is perfect karma for this company that they, again, had Raw in a half-empty arena where they had to tarp off the entire upper deck and most of the camera side was empty and three of your four top guys weren't physically there in person in the ring in Strowman, Lesnar, and Cena. Now, surely a lot of people are just going to blame Reigns because he's the one that's actually there and no question, he's a part of the problem. But the whole concept, again, of doing Reigns and Cena when you can't even fill your arena for this story, which has so many natural elements there, even though I get a lot of adult fans don't like these two fucks, it is an indictment on this company and their product that you've gotten to that point where you hot shot at this angle several months ahead of where the hell you should have, and your audience has decreased in size over the past couple of weeks with these guys having their featured program. Just think about that. And what an indictment that is on this company as a whole. Goldust versus Bray. It was dumb. We're still basically fighting over face paint. And when Finn Balor got up on the damn Titantron, he starts off by saying, A shy little boy who always felt just a little bit different. I really thought Finn Balor was coming out of the closet to say he was fucking gay. And honestly... It would be the most interesting thing Finn Balor ever did on television. And frankly, it would be entirely believable if he did. At this point in time, he's talking about the demon this and the man that created the demon. I thought he was talking about masturbation stuff. And talking about, well, if the demon was this, what does that say about the man that created him? I still thought he was coming on to Bray Wyatt. I know it's just me and my warped little mind, but it just further emphasizes that I don't give a shit about this feud. Asuka's coming to Raw. Y'all can celebrate. I can't wait to see how they long-term screw her up. Build her up so that way she can job to Rousey at WrestleMania at some point. Uh, the Bobby the Brain tribute, while it wasn't really emotional and it wasn't really sad or sappy, and maybe some people were disappointed by it. I know some people were getting really mad because they thought the WWE wasn't going to do one, and of course they ultimately did. Um, I thought the tribute was just fine. I thought it was adequate, and if anything, I thought it was kind of cool. I mean, because, frankly, you're trying to encapsulate this legend's career into a three-minute snippet. It's going to leave so many things out, but so many things about Bobby the Brain Heenan were so funny and so entertaining. Why did you want to make a sad P tribute video? I thought the tribute video was appropriate for the person and for the situation. What I did not think was appropriate was having Braun Strowman actually come out a little bit later after that tribute video, to sit there and destroy Enzo Amore. This company just can't help themselves with continuing to try and sabotage this guy and send him a message. It's just, why are you doing this? Whether you like it or not, the dude got over. You're not in a position where you can pick and choose this crap because you're not good enough to do it, so stop doing it. But I will say, as Prawn came out and he destroyed Enzo, it was just like that eureka moment of like, oh my freaking god. The real money to be made here would be Braun Strowman is kind of like a semi-effeminate, um, weight-conscious fat shamer that comes out and wants the Cruiserweight Championship and avows and claims that he's only 205 pounds on the nose and nobody will ever tell him no and he could run roughshod through the Cruiserweight division because at this point in time, that Cruiserweight division fucking don't matter. So what the hell difference does it make? Why not do something like that? Because again, you're in front of half fucking empty arenas. So why not shake shit up a little bit? That's what I thought about the whole time. I'm like, how stupid it is that they continue to do this crap to Enzo. And my God, that's where the real money is with Braun Strowman once he gets done with this unnecessary Brock Lesnar business. Uh, the six-pack challenge for uh, the number one contendership to the IC title at No Mercy. I appreciate that the main event of this show 
uh, revolved around who was going to face The Miz at No Mercy. I'm fine with that. It was a story that played out throughout the night. You had several people doing interviews and so on and so forth. Um, but by this point in time, I had long since checked out. Looking at the uh, hour-by-hour breakdowns of the viewership for this show, a lot of other people had too. You know, and even Jason Jordan winning, you know, it was the appropriate thing to do story-wise. It's the thing that makes sense. It just feels like it largely isn't going to grab it, you know, grab the hold of the audience. It's not really going to work. Um, but it just felt like watching this week's show that there were very few things that this company did that actually worked. It's almost like you felt as though the WWE understood they were going up against Monday Night Football. They know that they only had a half-empty arena. And it was like they intentionally went out and intended to give you a half arena's worth of show. That's what this felt like. Shame on this company, but I'm not surprised by this company and anything that they do anymore.